say that we had all this envisioned when we were making Pitch Black four or five years ago, but that truly isn't the case. Though we learned from our mistakes, and now we are very concerned with understanding where this series of films is going from this point forward. What Pitch Black was is it introduced you to the Riddick character as the anti-hero and, and a couple of characters who, who come back in this. But what was interesting about this is that we hadn't really defined the world. We got a good understanding of who Riddick is. We know what we can expect from him, but where is he from and what universe does he live in? We've got many worlds in the Chronicles of Riddick, and that's one of the things that helps separate it from, you know, the Pitch Black. Pitch Black was one world, one situation. But now we break out into almost a multiverse of worlds. And one of those hero worlds that we deal with is called Helion Prime. And when the Necromongers come to town, this is the first planet they want to take out. It is also the location of uh, New Mecca, which was, if you remember from the first Pitch Black, which is where Imam was headed. And that's where we find him, in this sort of Islamic district called New Mecca, of this larger place called Helion Prime. I think one of the things that, that the, the character of Riddick symbolizes is good people do bad things, or bad people do good things. Lots of people begin to act out the persona that other people lay on them. I think Riddick is one of those kind of people. I think a mom is a strong character. I think he's got very strong beliefs, but he's a family man. He's got a, a very interesting parental feel that comes across. Imam has always been sort of the spiritual core for us. He represents, uh, you know, probably the good side of religion. Because Riddick is a guy who has always struggled with his faith. And his brief encounters with Imam help show him that there may be room in his life for some kind of spirituality. I believe that most religions stem from a philosophy about a way of life. Here's a man who does that. He lives what he talks about, which is fantastic. The blade comes off and the bounty comes off. This is Arian, an envoy from the elemental race. She means you no harm. The character Arian was specifically created for Judy Dench. Action. Arian is a mysterious character for her. She has certain secrets that she lets out only when she needs to let them out. So a very mysterious character. I think uh, very well grounded by uh, how we've cast her, Judy Dench, Dame Judy Dench. I think she's quite mischievous. You're not sure whether this person is for good or bad, but I think you never should be quite absolutely sure as whose side she's on. If you cut my throat, I'll not be able to rescind the offer that brought you here. I'm terribly flattered that um, somebody uh, of Vin's age, for instance, uh, wants me to be in his picture, that David Tui. I'm very, very flattered. I have to tell you, for years I had been talking about the fact that the actor I wanted to work with most was Judy Dench. And acting with Vin Diesel. That's pretty impressive in my family. Necromon. It is the name that will convert or kill every last human life. really a long journey starting with getting the script and imagining that world which David dreamed up. Okay, let's talk about doors. Yeah, this is a larger scale detail of the door. We, we also are building an extension to that corridor. That'd be good. It's gonna be extended like 10, 12 feet, I believe. We use details to look almost like, um, you know, art deco. Um, so you, just a combination, how you put them together on one building and how you put lots of buildings together to create a city feeling, which it is, a street feeling. People doing what they do, they walk, they have shops, they need to eat, they need to drink, they need uh, pottery or what have you, or, or high-tech equipment. So all this is not new, it is more how you put it together. We started by referencing a lot of, uh, of the great Islamic architecture, you know, that, kind of that Moorish influence, and then we wanted to add a sci-fi element too. If you look at, uh, you know, most of the facades, you will see some, some elements of older buildings, like, for example, the facade of Imam's house over here has an old stone facade with old uh, uh, wooden shutters and so on, but then the rest of the house is fairly new. The work that was put into this production is fantastic. It looks like a street. It looks like a Meccan street. The costume concepts that I did 
you know, I wanted to, to have it have that old flair with the new. I being a novice to the genre, all I knew is that I didn't want it to look like a costume and the Helians were the nice people. That's kind of the box that I work in. They said, don't think of it as sci-fi. But that was really a good release because when you don't think of it as sci-fi, you could go to any place you want, so you make it all up. We're very much interested in showing the audience stuff they haven't seen before. Huh? And when it comes to the, you know, the wild action sequences in, in this movie, you know, we have an action sequence called The Siege of Helion, where the truly evil guys in the film, the necromongers, are, are taking siege of this capital city. And we do it all at night. When the, um, you know, the battle starts against the necromongers, I thought it might be cool if we were to see some Helion soldiers that were very decorative, almost like they were the ceremonial guard. And they've called up everybody to fight these guys, but of course nothing works. You know, they get, they get spanked. I worked with uh, Tommy Tomlinson, the prop master, and um, we kind of did a pass at some of the props. I, I really enjoyed um, Helion guns. Hundred Meccan soldiers, and we'll have three hundred Necro soldiers, all propped, ready to go. Actual firing weapons. We have a hundred actual Necro weapons to fire. We have thirty of the Hellion rifles that actually fire. That's yeah, a big prop show. Biggest one I've ever been on for quantities. This is the probably the hardest gun um, that I've had to do. And inside of this, there is a tank which I fill up with acetylene gas and through a series of solenoids, glow plugs, and electronics, it will fire the acetylene at a certain angle to get that perfect little blast. Very safe, very cold fire. Put your hand right next to it. Very safe for the actors. We worked on this for months to get that exact position so we can get that effect. Video. video Action Josh. My name is Ian Hunter. Uh, we are in charge of doing all the miniature sequences for Chronicles of Riddick. Uh, in this case, what we're building is a miniature street of the planet Helion, which is where much of the action takes place. Uh, within the movie, our hero uh, is being chased by the bad guys who are necromongers in a uh, ship called the Sarcophagus. Riddick's trying to escape it when we have some missile hits that inflict damage on the ship, causing the ship to nose into the street, and it looks like it's gonna take our hero out when miraculously, of course, it flips over into a building, explodes. We now have a situation where we are actually tilting the camera at the same time the ship is flipping, and we have to ex actually line the camera up with a figure on the top of the ship, which happens to be the director of the movie. So David Tui now is gonna have himself emblazoned on the top of the spaceship. So what we've done is we've built a miniature street of Helion, and we've built a miniature of the sarcophagus spaceship. We've then built a flying rig, which is over our heads, that pulls the ship along, suspended over the street. We've uh, constructed a pit within the street. We're then putting a very thin breakaway plaster shell on top of that, which represents the paving. We're then gonna put individual tiles uh, on top of that shell. So the hope is that when the ship penetrates the street, it'll break the paving, send the tiles flying, send the underlaying dirt up, and then, of course, mechanically, we're going to then flip it and have it fly, uh, do an endo over our camera, and uh, miraculously save the hero. All right, guys, everybody set. This is picture right now. Yeah. Hey, if this thing what, cuts what free, you guys right are in now. harm's way. Say again. <laughs> Go!
I've not done a film like this ever. And in this kind of scale, this is one of the avenues that I didn't know existed. For me, I mean, a huge movie. Being here was the greatest excitement, just having being, being here at all. It was, you know, wonderfully exciting. It's such an ambitious story that it'll take several films to tell, and that's exciting and that's challenging. And when things are exciting and challenging, they're always fun. <laughs> and there are precious few anti-heroes to be found in films these days. And that's why we embrace this, and we go forward with that anti-hero character. And that's what helps distinguish this series of films from all those other sort of white bread approaches to science fiction that you see out there. You know, we are not that. We are something that marches to a more chaotic drum.